The Pharsalia by Lucan. Chapter 3, Part 2. Now fell the forests far and wide, despoiled of all their giant trunks. For as the mound on earth and brushwood stood, a timber frame held firm the soil, lest pressed beneath its towers the mass might topple down. There stood a grove which from the earliest time no hand of man had dared to violate. Hidden from the sun its chill recesses, matted boughs entwined, prisoned the air within. No sylvan nymphs here found a home, nor pan, but savage rites and barbarous worship, altars horrible on massive stones upreared, sacred with blood of men was every tree. If faith be given to ancient myth, no fowl has ever dared to rest upon those branches, and no beast has made his lair beneath. No tempest falls, nor lightnings flash upon it from the cloud. Stagnant the air, unmoving, yet the leaves filled with mysterious trembling, dripped the streams from coal-black fountains. Effigies of gods rude, scarcely fashioned from some fallen trunk, held the mid-space, and pallid with decay, their rotting shapes struck terror. Thus do men dread most the god unknown. T'was said that caves rumbled with earthquakes, that the prostrate yew rose up again, that fiery tongues of flame gleamed in the forest depths, yet were the trees unkindled, and that snakes in frequent folds were coiled around the trunks. Men flee the spot, nor dare to worship near, and e'en the priest or when bright Phoebus holds the height, or when dark night controls the heavens, in anxious dread draws near the grove, and fears to find its lord. Spared in the former war, still dense it rose where all the hills were bare, and Caesar now its fall commanded. But the brawny arms that swung the, swayed the axes trembled, and the men, awed by the sacred grove's dark majesty, held back the blow they thought would be returned. This Caesar saw, and swift within his grasp uprose a ponderous axe, which downward fell, cleaving a mighty oak that towered to heaven. While thus he spake, Henceforth let no man dread to fell this forest. All the crime is mine. This be your creed. He spake, and all obeyed, for Caesar's ire weighed down the wrath of heaven. Yet cease they not to fear. Then first the oak, Dodona's ancient boast, The knotty holm, the cypress, witness of patrician grief, The buoyant alder, laid their foliage low, admitting day, Though scarcely through the stems their fall found passage. At the sight the Gauls grieved, But the garrison within the walls rejoiced, For thus shall men insult the gods, and find no punishment? Yet fortune oft protects the guilty. On the poor alone the gods can vent their ire. Enough hewn down, they seize the country wagons, And the hind, his oxen gone, which else had drawn the plough, Mourns for his harvest. But the eager chief, impatient of the combat by the walls, Carries the warfare to the furthest west. Meanwhile, a giant mound on star-shaped wheels concealed, they fashion, crowned with double towers high as the battlements, by cause unseen slow creeping onwards, while amazed the foe beheld, and thought some subterranean gust had burst the caverns of the earth and forced the nodding pile aloft, and wondered sore their walls should stand unshaken. From its height hissed down the weapons, but the Grecian bolts with greater force were on the Romans hurled, nor by the arm unaided, for the lance urged by the catapult resistless rushed through arms and shields and flesh, and left a death behind, nor stayed its course. And massive stones cast by the beams of mighty engines fell, as from the mountain top some time worn rock at length by winds dislodged, in all its tracks spreads ruin vast nor crushed the life alone forth from the body, but dispersed the limbs in fragments undistinguished, and in blood. 
But, as protected by the armor shield, the might of Rome drew nigh beneath the wall, the front rank with their bucklers interlaced and held above their helms. The missiles fell behind their backs, nor could the toiling Greeks deflect their engines, throwing still the bolts far into space, but from the rampart top flung ponderous masses down. Long as the shields held firm together, like to hail that falls harmless upon a roof, so long the stones crushed down innocuous. But as the blows rained fierce and ceaseless, and the Romans tired, some here and there sank fainting. Next the roof advanced with earth besprinkled. Underneath the ram conceals his head, which poised and swung. They dash with mighty force upon the wall, covered themselves with mantlets. Though the head light on the lower stones, yet as the shock falls and refalls, from battlement to base the rampart soon shall topple. But by bulks and rocky fragments overwhelmed and flames, the roof at length gave way, and worn with toil all spent in vain, the weary troops withdrew and sought the shelter of their tents again. Thus far to hold their battlements was all the Greeks had hoped. Now, venturing attack, with glittering torches for their arms, by night, fearless, they sallied forth. Nor lance they bear, nor deadly bow, nor shaft, for fire alone is now their weapon. Through the Roman works, driven by the wind, the conflagration spread. Nor did the newness of the wood make pause the fury of the flames, which, fed afresh by living torches, neath a smoky pall leaped on in fiery tongues. Not wood alone, but stones gigantic, crumbling into dust, dissolved beneath the heat. The mighty mound lay prone, yet in its ruin larger seemed. Next, conquered on the land, upon the main they try their fortunes. On their simple craft no painted figure had adorned the bows, nor claimed protection from the gods. But rude, just as they fell upon their mountain homes, the trees were knit together, and the deck gave steady foothold for an ocean fight. Meantime had Caesar's squadron kept the isles named Stoicades, and Brutus' turret ship mastered the Rhone. Nor less the Grecian host, boys not yet grown to war, and aged men, armed for the conflict with their all at stake. Nor only did they marshal for the fight ships meet for service, but their ancient keels brought from the dockyards. When the morning rays broke from the waters, and the sky was clear, and all the winds were still upon the deep, smooth for the battle, swift on either part the fleets essay the open, and the ships tremble beneath the oars that urge them on, by sinewy arms impelled. Upon the wings that bound the Roman fleet, the larger craft, with triple and quadruple banks of oars, gird in the lesser, so they front the sea, while in their rear, shaped as a crescent moon, Liburnian galleys follow. Over all towers Brutus's deck praetorian. Oars on oars propel the bulky vessel through the main, six ranks, the topmost strike the waves afar. When such a space remained between the fleets as could be covered by a single stroke, innumerable voices rose in air, drowning with resonant din the heat of beat of oars and note of trumpet summoning, and all sat on the benches, and with mighty stroke swept o'er the sea and gained the space between, then crashed the prows together, and the keels rebounded backwards, and unnumbered darts, or darkened all the sky, or in their fall the vacant ocean. As the wings grew wide, less densely packed the fleet, some Grecian ships pressed in between, as when with west and east the tide contends, this way the waves are driven, and that the sea. So as they plough the deep, in various lines converging, what the prow throws up advancing, from the foeman's oars falls back repelled. But soon the Grecian fleet was handier found in battle, and in flight pretended, and in shorter curves could round, more deftly governed by the guiding helm. While on the Roman side their steadier keels gave vantage as to men who fight on land. Then Brutus to the pilot of his ship. Dost suffer them to range the wider deep, contending with the foe in naval skill? Draw close the war, and drive us on the prows of these Phocians. 
him the pilot heard, and turned his vessel slantwise to the foe. Then was the sea all covered with the war. Then Grecian ships attacking, Brutus found their ruin in the stroke, and vanquished lay beneath, beside his bulwarks, while with grappling hooks others laid fast the foe, themselves by oars held back the while. And now no outstretched arm hurls forth the javelin, but hand to hand with swords they wage the fight. Each from his ship leans forward to the stroke, and falls when slain upon a foeman's deck. Deep flows the stream of purple slaughter to the foamy main. By piles of floating corpses are the sides, though grappled, kept asunder. Some, half dead, plunge in the ocean, gulping down the brine and crimson with their blood. Some, lingering still, draw their last struggling breath amid the wreck of broken navies. Weapons which have missed find yet their victims, and the falling steel fails not in middle deep to deal the wound. One vessel, circled by Phocaean keels, divides her strength, and on the right and left, on either side with equal war, contends. On whose high poop, while Tagus fighting gripped the stern Phocaean, pierced his back and breast two fatal weapons. In the midst the steel meets, and the blood uncertain whence to flow, stands still, arrested, till with double course, forth by a sudden gush it drives each dart and sends the life abroad through either wound. Here fated Telon also steered his ship. No pilot's hand upon an angry sea more deftly ruled a vessel. Well he knew, either by the sun or crescent moon, how best to set his canvas fitted for the breeze tomorrow's light would bring. His rushing stern shadowed a Roman vessel. But a dart, hurled at the moment, quivered in his breast. He falls, and in the fall his dying hand diverts the prow. Then Gyarius in act to climb the friendly deck, by javelin pierced, still as he hung, by the retaining steel fast to the side was nailed. Twin brethren stand of fruitful mother's pride, with different fates, but ne'er distinguished till death's savage hand struck once, and ended error. He that lived cause of fresh anguish to their souring souls, called ever to the weeping parents back the image of the lost, who as the oars, Grecian and Roman, mixed their teeth oblique, grasped with his dexter hand the Roman ship, when fell a blow that shorn his arm away. So died upon the side it held the hand, nor loosed its grasp in death. Yet with the wound his noble courage rose, and maimed he dared renew the fray, and stretched across the sea to grasp the lost. In vain, another blow lopped arm and hand alike, nor shield nor sword henceforth are his. Yet even now he seeks no sheltering hold, but with his chest advanced before his brother armed, he claims the fight, and holding in his breast the darts which else had slain his comrades, Pierced with countless spears, he falls in death well earned. Yet ere his end collects his parting life, And all his strength strains to the utmost, And with failing limbs leaps on the foeman's deck, By weight alone injurious. For streaming down with gore, and piled on high with corpses, While her sides sounded to ceaseless blows, The fated ship, let in the greedy brine, until her ways were level with the waters. Then she plunged in whirling eddies downwards, and the main first parted, then closed in upon its prey. Full many wondrous deaths, with fates diverse, upon the sea in that that day's fight befell. Caught by a grappling hook that missed the side, had Lycidas been whelmed in middle deep. But by his feet his comrades dragged him back, And rent in twain he hung, Nor slowly flowed as from a wound the blood, But all his veins were torn asunder, And the stream of life gushed o'er his limbs Till lost amid the deep. From no man dying has the vital breath Rushed by so wide a path. The lower trunk succumbed to death, But with the lungs and heart long strove the fates, And hardly won the whole. 
while, bent upon the fight, an eager crew were gathered to the margin of their deck, leaving the upper side as bare of foes, their ship was overset. Beneath the keel which floated upwards, prisoned in the sea, and powerless by spread of arms to float the main, they perished. One, who haply swam amid the battle, chanced upon a death strange and unheard of, for two meeting prows transfixed his body. At the double stroke wide yawned his chest, blood issued from his mouth with flesh commingled, and the brazen beaks resounding clashed together by the bones unhindered. Now they part, and through the gap swift pours the sea and drags the corpse below. Next, of a shipwrecked crew, the larger part, struggling with death upon the waters, reached a comrade bark, but when with elbows raised, that they seized upon the bulwarks and the ship, rolled, nor could bear their weight. The ruthless crew hacked off their straining arms. Then maimed, they sank below the seething waves to rise no more. Now every dart was hurled, and every spear, the soldier weaponless, yet their rage found arms. One hurls an oar, another's brawny arm tugs at the twisted stern, or from the seats, the oarsman driving, swings a bench in air. The ships are broken for the fight. They seize the fallen dead and snatch the sword that slew. Nay, many from their wounds, frenzied for arms, pluck forth the deadly st steel, and pressing still upon their yawning sides, hurl forth the spear back to the hostile ranks from which it came. Then ebbs their life-blood forth. But deadlier yet was that fell force most hostile to the sea. For thrown in torches and in sulphurous bolts, fire all-consuming ran among the ships, whose oily timbers soaked in pitch and wax inflammable gave welcome to the flames. Nor could the wa waves prevail against the blaze which claimed, as for its own, the fragments borne upon the waters. Lo, on burning plank one hardly scapes destruction. One, to save his flaming ship, gives entrance to the main. Of all the forms of death, each fears the one that brings immediate dying, yet quails not their heart in shipwreck. From the waves they pluck the fallen darts, and furnishing the ship, assay the feeble stroke. And should that hope still fail their hand, they call the sea to aid, and seizing in their grasp some floating foe, drag him to mutual death. But on that day, Phocius, above all others, proved his skill. Well trained was he to dive beneath the main and search the waters with unfailing eye, and should an anchor against the straining rope too firmly bite the sands to wrench it free, oft in his fatal grasp he seized a foe, nor loosed his grip until the life was gone. Such was his frequent deed. But this his fate. For rising, victor as he thought, to air, full on a keel he struck, and found his death. Some, drowning, seized a hostile oar, and checked the flying vessel, not to die in vain their single care. Some on their vessel's side, hanging, in death, with wounded frame essayed to check the charging prow. Tyrannus high upon the bulwarks of his ship was struck by leaden bolt from Balearic string of Ligdomus, Straight through his temples passed the faded missile, and in streams of blood, forced from their seats, his trembling eyeballs fell. Plunged in a darkness as of night, he thought that life had left him. Yet ere long he knew the living rigor of his limbs, and cried, Place me, O friend, as some machine of war, straight facing towards the foe. Then shall my darts strike as of old. And thou, Tyrannus, spend thy latest breath still left, upon the fight. So shalt thou play, not wholly dead, the part that fits the soldier, and the spear that strikes thy frame shall miss the living. Thus he spake, and hurled his javelin blind, but not in vain. For Argus, generous youth of noble blood, below the middle waist, received the spear, and, falling, drove it home. His aged sire, from furthest portion of the conquered ship, beheld, than whom in pride of manhood none more brave than battle. Now no more he fought, 
yet did the memory of his proas steal stir phocaean youths to emulate his fame off stumbling over the benches the old man hastes to reach his boy and finds him breathing still no tear bedewed his cheek nor on his breast one blow he struck but o'er his eyes there fell a dark impenetrable veil of mist that blotted out the day nor could he more discern his luckless argus he who saw his parent raising up his drooping head with parted lips and silent features asks a father's latest kiss a father's hand to close his dying eyes but soon his sire recovering from his swoon when ruthless grief possessed his spirit this short space he cried i lose not which the cruel gods have given but die before thee grant thy sorrowing sire forgiveness that he fled thy last embrace not yet has passed thy life-blood from the wound nor yet is death upon thee still thou mayest outlive thy parent thus he spake and seized the reeking sword and drove it to the hilt then plunged into the deep with headlong bound to anticipate his son for this he feared a single form of death should not suffice now gave the fates their judgment and in doubt no longer was the war the grecian fleet in most part sunk some ships by romans oared conveyed the victors home in headlong flight some sought the yards for shelter on the strand what tears of parents for their offspring slain how wept the mothers mid the pile confused oft times the wife sought madly for her spouse and chose for her last kiss some roman slain while wretched fathers by the blazing pyres fought for the dead but brutus thus at sea first gained a triumph for great caesar's arms end of book 3